So welcome all to the networking uh, dinner session with Jason Griffey. And it's a pleasure for us to have him join us virtually at the IDEA Institute on Artificial Intelligence. So Jason, let me share with uh, our group a little bit about you. Uh, Jason Griffey is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the National Information Standards Organization, or NISO, where he works to identify new areas of the information ecosystem where standards expertise is useful and needed and leads ongoing projects such as NISO's participation in the Coalition for Seamless Access. He's also the chair and director of the NISO Plus Conference, which I invite all of you to join. It's a great opportunity to talk about really challenging and interesting issues that is a global conversation. Prior to joining NISO in 2019, Jason ran his own technology consulting company for libraries and has been both an affiliate at Meta Lab and a fellow and affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, and was an academic librarian in roles ranging from reference and instruction to head of library IT at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. So he knows the local area. Jason has written extensively on technology and libraries including multiple books and a series of full periodical issues on technological topics. Most recently, AI and machine learning in libraries and library spaces and smart buildings, technology metrics and iterative design from 2018. He has spoken internationally on topics such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, the future of technology in libraries, decentralization and the blockchain, privacy, copyright, and intellectual property. Then more personally, if you want to get to know him, he can be stalked obsessively online at Griffey and spends his free time with his daughter, Eliza, reading, obsessing over gadgets, and preparing for the inevitable zombie uprising. So with that short introduction uh, and the amazing work and perspectives that Jason brings, Please welcome him, and he's going to talk about traveling into the future on neural engines. Welcome, Jason. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry that I cannot be there with you. I uh, would very much like to be uh, just slightly north of myself. I am actually in Tennessee. Uh, I am in South Central Tennessee at a little town called Sewanee, where my uh, family lives. Um, Today, my goal is to, uh, well, number one, make my camera stop jumping around like it is. And then uh, let me see if I can manage that real quick. Uh, all right, we're fine. Um, my goal today is to talk to you about a number of things uh, AI and ML related, right? Um, first off, you know, that was a wonderful introduction, but just to give you a sort of overview of uh, why I'm here, I've done a lot of things in libraries. Almost my entire career has been uh, revolving around emerging technologies and sort of near future potential for technologies. One of the uh, most recent things that I have been involved in uh, was indeed the American Library Association um, publication of artificial intelligence and machine learning in libraries, where I was the editor and uh, author of a couple of the chapters. There's some really wonderful stuff in here if you've not had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, that link will actually give you a free PDF copy of it. So uh, I will share this, um, a PDF of this presentation. So don't worry about frantically scrabble, you know, scribbling it down right now. But if you would, uh, if you'd like to have a PDF of this, I am more than happy to share with you. Um, what, what I'm going to do today uh, over the next 45 minutes or so is uh, try to talk to you about sort of where we are right now in the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning in hopes of opening your mind a little to seeing where we will be, right? Um, the wonderful thing about emerging technology is that it, it, it paints a pathway for us uh, as to where the likely outcomes of this technology may, may lead us. And so uh, if we understand what's going on in the world right now, then we have a much better idea of how to prepare for the world that will be. And so uh, today I'm going to do that in a couple of ways. One, we're going to just talk a little bit very generically about AI and machine learning systems um, 
up front. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite and most interesting examples of sort of what machine learning can do in the world of media and uh, creation. And then we're going to look at some library examples <clears throat> that are particularly interesting, some things that relate directly to information or information analysis and um, things that uh, that may drive sort of some of the, the future of libraries and the interface that we present to the world. And then uh, at the end, I'll conclude with just a little bit of talk about um, some of the concerns that I have about the world that is likely to be emerging. And so uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. As I uh, said, I'm going to give you the slides, so don't worry about, you know, having to keep up with all of the tools or anything. You'll have those available to you um, shortly after the talk. And then afterwards, I hope to be able to have a really uh, nice conversation with you about sort of what your, you know, hopes, dreams, concerns, thoughts, uh, wishes um, and, uh, and, and the, the future, you know, what you, what you'd like the future to look like of this, um, of this world. So one of the things that fascinates me about where we are in the world of, uh, AI and machine learning is one of the reasons that we're, where we are is that, um, computing technology has gotten to the point where we can afford in the sort of power and, uh, um, computational sense to kind of throw away computing cycles on artificial intelligence. That is, we have chips now that are cheap enough and plentiful enough and uh, inexpensive enough to run that we can afford to sort of have AI systems and machine learning systems in many, many, many places. Now, when I say machine learning or artificial intelligence or sort of any of the, you know, myriad, you know, neural engines, neural nets, any of the sort of, you know, jargon around this part of uh, technology. There's a, a couple of different ways that people tend to take it, right? There's either the weak uh, AI, which is a, a system that's trained to do sort of one thing, and it does it very well, often better than humans, or the sort of strong AI, which is when people sort of imagine, you know, Skynet and Terminator. Uh, it's the, the AI where uh, a machine is capable of replacing or replicating human endeavor in a, in a general sense. That is, you have a machine that's capable of doing many things that humans uh, previously were uh, only the only, you know, things able to, uh, to do that that sort of thinking process. Uh, what we have in the world now is weak AI. No, I'm, I'm not a proponent of strong AI. I'm not going to be arguing in this talk that strong AI is on the way. I do not think we have um, a Skynet apocalypse coming upon us. Um, the, uh, the world that we have and the world that we're likely to continue to have is made up of, um, of weak AI systems. That is systems that are trained and specifically designed to do sort of one thing very, very well. The trick is that these things do them much better than humans do, and you can put multiple systems together so that it appears as if they are more generally intelligent than they really are. So the combination of systems is often more than the individual systems themselves, right? Um, but I, I'm not going to be arguing strongly for a, uh, for a, a strong AI system. I don't, think that's, um, I don't think that's in the cards. Um, AI is a thing that, uh, you know, you're setting, uh, you're setting and you've been working to understand and think about and, and, and integrate into your practice. Um, most of our patrons, if you said, you know, hey, do you use artificial intelligence? They would probably say, like, what are you talking about, right? But the truth is, of course, that everyone now basically uses AI and machine learning systems every day of their life without realizing it. This is a uh, search in my phone's uh, photo application for the word ocean. Um, I did not classify these, right? This was not a system where a human went through and categorized them. This is a machine learning system that lives in my pocket that was trained on millions or billions of photos of oceans and responds when I search for ocean through a neural net and into the machine learning training data, machine learning training system uh, to emerge with these photos of beaches and oceans. Um, everyone's phone has this going on all the time in their pocket right now, 
right? So this isn't a, a rarefied or unusual piece of technology. This is a piece of technology that people have in their pocket all the time, every day. We just don't often think about it that way. Um, so what 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 are these? What 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 are we doing with these with these uh, AI systems? Right? Like so, what? How do they work? What do we do? I know that you know part of your curriculum this week has been looking at different ways that AI handles things in the world. I'm going to talk about two that I think are both particularly interesting for libraries, uh, particularly interesting for media and creativity in general, uh, and pretty interesting for the world at large. Kind of you know in expanding bubbles. The first of these is a generative adversarial network or a GAN. <clears throat> and this is a really clever and interesting sort of um, sort of AI machine learning system. Um, for those who aren't familiar, really quickly, um, you, you basically have two different machine learning systems, one called a generator and one called a discriminator. You train, that is, you provide a lot of data to the discriminator and you say, this is the data that I want you to uh, you know, recognize. Here's all my good data. This is the, the world I want you to know about. So for instance, let's say we were trying to train a, a machine learning system to uh, create pictures of cats. We would first have to train the discriminator, what is a cat, right? What does a cat look like? And so we just feed it billions of pictures of cats and we let it sort of decide that these things are all representative of what it is that we call a cat. And then we say to the generator, well, just make something up, just create some data, right? And the first time it does that, it's just random noise. It's just static. It's nonsense, right? It's white noise. There's no pattern there because it doesn't know what it's doing it's a completely it's 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 just generating white noise the secret to a machine learning system called a gan is we then take that and say hey this thing that the generator created discriminator is is this a cat and the discriminator says no 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 that's not a cat this is a cat your thing not a cat totally not a cat but if you do this it'll look more like a cat. And then you run it again, right? And the, you ask the discriminator, does this look like a cat? And then the generator makes something else based on that data. And then you run it again, right? And as you run it, every time you run this cycle, you say, the discriminator says, is the thing I'm given a cat? And then it feeds it to the generator and says, no, 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 do better. And you end up with, this cycle where eventually you end up with things that look like cats, completely artificial, completely made up, completely generated, not a real thing, not something that exists in nature, but nonetheless, a thing that looks like and appears to us to be, right, a cat. Turns out you can do this for basically anything in the world. Uh, for example, one of these humans, either the guy, uh, either the, the, the male presenting or the female presenting human, um, is real and one of them is an AI generated uh, human. So uh, I can see you a little bit. So um, I'd, I'd like you to take like three seconds. How many people think the male presenting individual is uh, real? Okay, how many think the female presenting individual is real? Okay, you're all wrong, they're both fake. Neither of these are real people. Uh, these are entirely fake, false people, fake images, not real, not human, et cetera. These are generated by a GAN. When I started talking about and researching and sort of got into artificial intelligence machine learning many, many, many years ago, that process of creating something that looked real, right, that to our eyes looked real, took huge amounts of computing power. It took specialized machines and it took... Uh, a, a huge amount of effort and energy. And now today it's a website. You can literally go to this person does not exist.com and hit a button and have it create a fake human for you. Um, which is kind of an amazing thing. <clears throat> the other type of um, uh, machine learning system that I wanted to point out to you again, if, if you're not familiar with this is called a clip, a contrastive language image pre-training system. 
This is uh, a system that is trained similarly to a GAN, except that it's trained using image text pairs. So you have an image and then some text about the image, and those both of those are put into the model that the, the uh, machine learning system is trained on, right? What you get out the other side from the generative side of the world is you can actually tell one of these systems in sort of natural language. You can just type a sentence or type a couple of words, adjective, noun, whatever, and uh, have it make you an image or have you have it classify images based on that uh, on that feedback. So you can do a number of different things with these when you combine uh, text. So for just a couple of quick examples, if I were, uh, this is, a, these are examples from a combined GAN and CLIP system where you have a generator as well as this sort of image text pairing going on. And uh, you just describe what you want and it creates an image from the words you give it, right? Just completely artificial generative image from this machine learning system. So if we give, <clears throat> this is from a, <clears throat> excuse me, these are all from a um, machine learning system called Big Sleep which is a really popular uh, image generator. Uh, it's a Python, I think it's Python based, pretty sure it's Python based actually. Um, and uh, if we feed it cyberpunk riot, you get something that looks like this. If you feed it donut shop in the style of Escher, right? Literally you're just typing those words and then hitting go and letting it make an image for you. You get something like this. This is a generated image. How about Charizard in the style of Picasso? There's one. My personal favorite. <clears throat> Here comes midnight with the dead moon in its jaws. There's the image from that random string of text. And these can not only create um, uh, create still images, but they can create video as well. So I will give uh, bonus points, which I have I, I cannot possibly give you to anyone who recognizes this opening splash opening to a movie. Anybody know what movie this is? This is the the splash screen for the opening of Blade Runner. So the uh, Big Sleep was told create a video that looks like Blade Runner. Never, this is, you're just instructing machine learning system, right? Like literally in those words, make an opening, make a, make a, make a video that looks like Blade Runner. Now, clearly the machine's never seen Blade Runner. The machine doesn't have an aesthetic like preference. It doesn't understand filmmaking. It does like, you know, right? We throw sort of all of those human preconceptions out of the door and yet we get something that is definitely in the vein of the aesthetics of the movie Blade Runner, even though the machine obviously doesn't really know anything about it. Machine learning systems are being used in all sorts of very interesting ways in, uh, in media. And uh, here's a couple more of my favorites. This is a machine learning system that has learned to uh, colorize images. So you can go in and use it to colorize, um, colorize black and white images. This is actually a picture of my grandmother when she was young, um, colorized by the machine learning system. You can get some really fantastic looking examples out of systems like this because they're trained obviously over millions and you know they know what human you know hands look like and they know how light bends around the knuckle and they know how they they they've analyzed enough images that they understand this understand in big scare quotes and are able to be um to be trained to do uh things like this uh, in addition, they can also do that to video, right? There's no real difference as far as a computer is concerned between still images and video. Video is just a series of stills. There's no 
particular reason why one is any harder than the other. And so you end up with uh, the ability to do manipulation of um, automated, you know, autonomous manipulation of um, video as well. This is a, a, a very short video clip of the movie um, uh, Metropolis by Fritz Lang and uh, run through the deoldify system. So cleaned up, upscaled, and, um, and uh, colorized. Even creepier, you've also got things like deep nostalgia. Hopefully you've seen this before, and if not, uh, this is one of my very favorite examples. Uh, deep nostalgia is, well, machines can be trained what three-dimensional people look like, and we have a lot of pictures of two-dimensional people. So what if we just made video of two-dimensional people, right? What if we just fed them um, still images and asked them to make video of people? So this is not a video. This is a still shot that was manipulated by an artificial intelligence to look as if the person was captured in video. Another example, uh, this again, same picture of my uh, grandmother when she was about 18 years old. Um, you can uh, see it's not perfect by any stretch. You can see little little issues but it's still basically a magic trick it, it looks it's it it's one of those things that the first time i saw it really made me feel as if sort of you know clark's law was real any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic it, it seems like a harry potter photo right it seems like it's it's magical and if you can create faces from nothing and you can create video from stills and if you can do all of this manipulation, right, of media and imagery, suddenly um, just about everything is on the table. This is uh, obviously not Tom Cruise, even though it looks like Tom Cruise. <laughs> this is a, uh, a deep fake, effectively, video of uh, an actor portraying Tom Cruise with machine learning um, cleanup to make it look as if, obviously, it was the real actor, Tom Cruise. This is becoming much easier to do and much more common. Uh, you've probably seen other examples of this, but it will, um, I think the future of manipulated imagery is going to be one, especially in the age of misinformation and disinformation, uh, that is going to be extremely problematic for those of us who prefer um, reality-based reality. So uh, this is going to be um, something for libraries and librarians to wrestle with, I think, for, uh, for the next many decades. AI can also do just sort of interesting things with media, right? This, uh, some things that are not quite as uh, potentially damaging as the, the imagery manipulation. Uh, if anyone in here has ever, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sung karaoke, or uh, worked with audio. Uh, this is a, a new, newish. I, I only saw this very recently. Uh, la la dot la la dot AI, um, which allows you to feed it any song, basically any song in the world, and it will separate the vocals and uh, instrument instrumentation for you via machine learning. It uh, has been trained to recognize you know, how to tell those two things apart. And it basically just strips the two apart. This is extremely difficult to do for humans. Um, I don't know if anyone has any audio production experience, but trust me when I tell you, this is not something you would want to try and do manually. It is uh, very nearly miraculous that it is a thing that machine learning and uh, such can do. And for those of you in the audience that may be developers or programmers, um, you are probably familiar with this, which hit about uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, GitHub released uh, a thing called Copilot, which uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to pair program with you. So uh, you as the programmer can begin a line of, uh, of code and uh, Copilot will try to determine what it is that you're trying to do and then write 
the next section of code for you. So it sort of automates code production. Now, I am not a developer and I am not a programmer in any sense of the word that is meaningful. And so it is beyond my ken to tell you whether or not it does a good job. Um, there is a lot of discussion of this online right now, though. And uh, it, it seems like uh, the general consensus is probably not great, but it points in the direction of where things will be going over the course of the next 10 years. So, so what's this, what, what does all this look like in libraries, right? Like we've got all this sort of media manipulation and, you know, the eight machine learning systems doing all kinds of interesting things, but what are they doing like, you know, for libraries in libraries in the library space in our sort of information ecosystem? What is it that, um, that library that, you know, AI and machine learning is doing? <clears throat> and so I have a, a, a small suggestion as to the direction that I think we are likely to see over the next five to 10 years in uh, libraries. And that is that libraries, especially academic libraries, although public libraries to some degree and, and school libraries to a larger degree, um, involve themselves very heavily in the research process, right? Like we're, we're sort of a, a, an integral part of the process by which new knowledge is generated. We help uh, researchers, we help students sort of work their way through the research process. And the research process has a series of steps that are fairly well understood that, you know, we, anyone who's ever done a research methods class or a, you know, like you, we know this stuff. This is, this is library bread and butter, right? Um, all of these things, every single aspect of the research process is currently being done by AI. And um, these, again, are not great, but they are only going to get better. So in research, if you are doing active research, there are a number of tools. They're um, typically specialized in uh, specialized fields, either science, various sciences, or law right now, but they are becoming more general. Things like case text, where they have Kara AI, which is uh, you can give it sort of an outline of your research uh, agenda, and it will go out and find things for you and return them and continue searching after you walk away from the computer, et cetera, et cetera. Personal research assistant, wisdom.ai. Things like Diffio, your AI-powered research assistant, or Iris AI, research discovery with artificial intelligence. All of these and many, 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 many more are either currently active or coming, and they allow you to basically just wave your hand in the direction of research and let the AI bot, let the AI uh, go out and, and find the research, sort it for you, and return it to you in um in an organized fashion right so that's being disrupted currently by ai machine learning systems taking notes and writing paper right like integral part of the research process except of course you know that's also being um taken away uh or at least assisted by ai and machine learning systems right we have resumer which is a uh, a summary engine that will take uh, long, complicated articles and summarize them for you. Scholar C will create flashcards to give you just the highlights of any particular article or any particular piece of text that you give it. Uh, essay bot, finish your essay bot today. This is my favorite, um, my favorite tagline ever. Uh, essay bot suggests best content and helps you write. No plagiarism. I love their the I love the you know emphasis at the end of that. No plagiarism. Um, these are systems where, again, so you, you know, you have an AI bot that goes out and does your research for you and finds things that are of interest in your topic area and then brings those back to you. And then you can take those very same things and feed them to these other AIs, which will summarize, find key points, find the, the highlights of the uh, articles in question for you, and then return those to you. Right. Okay. Well, uh, we all are familiar with proofreading and editing software. Most of this is uh, being done these days by AI Grammarly, which I think everyone has probably heard of, right? This is an AI-powered writing assistant. It uses AI machine learning um, to make you sound better than you would natively. Um, writing assistant, it's a similar sort of thing, right? It's an AI system that uh, will take your writing and make it sound better, make it more complicated, make it more um, 
scholarly. So every one of these sort of research steps is being, um, you know, helped along by AI. And as I said early, right, these are all sort of, um, you know, soft AI. This is each one is particular to its own little area, but it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to imagine a large scholarly research uh, company, one that, you know, some, some, some company that makes billions of dollars doing research um, or pro providing research to, to uh, researchers, doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to imagine that they could pick off one of each of these, right? You pick off one that does research and you, you purchase one that does summaries and you purchase one that does uh, writing analysis, and then you take those and you sort of stitch them together. And I think there is a fairly strong potential in the next five to 10 years that we will see machine learning systems, AI bots that are um, marketed directly to researchers, especially undergraduate and early graduate researchers, with the promise that as they continue their education, the bot will stay with them the whole time, right? And learn as they learn. And so if you come in, I can easily imagine a situation where uh, a, a student comes in as a freshman and one of the things they get, one of the things they like participate in as a student is this like AI assistant that does a lot of the lifting for them, um, whether we like it or not those systems are going to emerge as part of the economy, sort of the, the info ecosystem. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it won't be good at the early stages, never is. But as I like to point out to uh, people when I do technology talks, right now is the worst technology will ever be. Like, technology from this point forward only ever gets better <laughs> like we all get it's we're not short of a zombie apocalypse or nuclear armageddon we're not going to like go backwards in our technology stack and so the technology that's available now will only ever get cheaper faster easier more available the technology that comes down the pike will continue that process and uh and so you know moving forward we should plan on there being more of these things, more, more, more technology, because that's the way the world, that's the way, that's the way it works. That's the way things go. Also in the library world, we've got a number of other things that are going on, really interesting projects that are going on in sort of the library-ish search engine -y sort of worlds in, um, with AI and machine learning. We have things like ANIF, uh, which is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic project that uses, um, it's an AI machine learning system that uses natural language to do uh, subject vocabulary assignments. So it's effectively a, a sort of cataloging tool, right? Um, you can feed it things, feed it um, uh, uh, new documents, and it will suggest, um, suggest new subject uh, terms for you. Currently works in a whole bunch of languages, including um, uh, sorting you into Hogwarts houses. It will sort documents into Hogwarts houses, which I think is fantastic. Um, so if you feed it a PDF, feed it a, uh, a set of text, it will tell you if it's a, if the text is Slytherin, which is great. Um, so, uh, but this is, you know, right in our wheelhouse, right? This is, uh, this is exactly the sort of thing that librarians are trained to do every day. This is the sort of thing that, you know, professional, it's one of our professional duties. This is, um, you know, again, not perfect. It's not exact. It's not doing everything that we wish it would do, but it will never get any worse than it is right now. Um, one of my favorite new search engines that uses machine learning and um, and uh, artificial intelligence. If you haven't had, ever had a chance to look at it, it is Flim F L I M dot AI Flim, uh, which is a play on film. Uh, Flim.ai uses machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence to classify imagery inside of films, inside of popular, inside of movies, just basically every, enormous corpus of movies somehow. 
And uh, you can do things like search for a red car. This is, was a search I tried um, not that long ago. You search for red car and you get a picture from Caddyshack and a picture from A Nightmare on Elm Street and a picture from Big Fish and a picture of Hot Summer Nights and a picture from all of these various movies with the frame that involves the, uh, the phrase that you give it. And you can give this really complicated phrasing. You could say like red car on a dirt road in the desert. And it would find you, you know, things of that nature. Um, if uh, it probably shouldn't escape your notice that this is uh, way better than any library search engine that you've ever tried. <laughs> um, you can imagine like a, 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 a patron setting down and searching for, you know, sad books about werewolves and trying to, and, you know, having it go through the corpus of, of literature and return to them sad books about werewolves. This is the equivalent except for film. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the latter is probably, uh, is hopefully being developed somewhere, well, not being developed in libraries most likely, which is sad, but um, that is the sort of thing that you can do with machine learning. Um, and then my favorite example of this that's actually being done by a librarian uh, is uh, a project by a librarian named Andromeda Yelton, who is uh, currently doing work for the Library of Congress as part of a grant for, for uh, image analysis. Um, if you're not familiar with Andromeda and her work in machine learning, you should be. Um, this is a project that she put together while she was still, she was uh, a developer at the MIT libraries for, uh, for a while. And this is a project that she began at that point called Hamlet, how about machine learning enhanced theses. This is the corpus of MIT's um, electronic theses and dissertations fed through a machine learning system, you know, trained through a machine learning system and then provided uh, an interface so that you can do recommendation. You can say, I like this one, show me other ones like it. You can uh, have it automatically do lit reviews for you. You can tell it, I want, you know, here's my, here's my text, show me all of the literature that is similar to it in this, you know, in the, in the theses and dissertations. And my favorite, you can actually upload, again, arbitrary text and say, show me the theses and dissertations that are most similar to this text, right? So if, you, if you're working in a field where MIT is likely to have uh, an aggressive amount of uh, theses and dissertations that you might want to check out in a science field or an engineering field, you could give it one exemplar of a document that you uh, that is you know, within the parameters of what you want, and it will then find other similar and return it. <clears throat> to give you some idea of how well that works, I, uh, when she was very early, when Andromeda was very early in the development of this, I had, I was playing around with it to see um, how, what it would do. And my first, the first thing I do with any new tool is try to break it because that's the, I don't know, that's just what, you know, it's what developers do. Um, and so I took the text of the novel Peter Pan by J.M. Barry. And I gave it to Hamlet and I said, show me MIT theses and dissertations that are the most like Peter Pan. And I thought briefly, like maybe it will show me something about, I don't know, flight or maybe, like, I don't know, what is it going to show me, right? That's a huge unknown. How is it going to treat this clearly not a science text um, against all of these, what clearly are mostly science texts? And I hit go and I waited a second and it returned and the results that it gave me were uh, all of the creative writing theses from MIT, which I, at that point, I just sort of threw my hands up and said, this is magic because, you know, the fact that it could tell, obviously, Peter Pan is a work of creative fiction and then make that connection to the creative writing texts that were in the, that, and that's all machine learning, no subject headings, no human interaction, nothing. So it's the sort of thing that can be done um, in the world of uh, libraries, very specifically, this is up and running. You can go and play with it yourself at the URL there. <coughs> Excuse me. So conclusions, what, um, what sort of conclusions would I like for you to draw from this? <clears throat> well, I mean, 
you know, I, early on, I said, um, the thing that interests me and the thing that I'd like people to think about are sort of the future ramifications, right? What if, what if you take this, but more? What if you take these things and expand them? And I think that we, we have a, a huge amount of opportunity in the library and information ecosystem to make really, truly wonderful things. We also have the opportunity to really screw up a lot of things. And um, so some of these conclusions are, are basically my, my worries about this part of the, um, about this part of the world. And that is <clears throat> we, in order to create these systems that people can use, we have to feed it data. All, uh, all machine learning systems and AI systems rely on data as their training mechanism, right? You have to show them what you want before you can ask them questions about what they will give you. And so, if we just give it data about the world we have been living in and then ask it questions about the future, there is the, the potential that we're just sort of codifying our biases, right? That we're just uh, giving it, we're, we're leading the witness. <laughs> we're, we're giving it the answers that we don't really want. And so I worry that, um, a lot of these tools, especially tools that have the potential to be sold to us by commercial vendors, might be um, might have sort of black box data training that would not pass muster if it was actually looked at carefully. And I really worry about just repeating the mistakes of history over and over and over. <clears throat> that's a thing that scares me quite a bit. And that's related to the fact that um, as librarians, we should have, and I think we do have a fairly strong ethical um, sense of what, you know, how, how we should be giving information to people, what sort of information we should be giving to people. And I worry that these systems, these new emerging AI and machine learning systems will lead to vendors and other outside agents, right? Non-library, non-librarian agents, trying to provide what they think we want and making ethical decisions external to us. Once those are already sort of in place in the systems, they're very hard to change. And we will, um, I fear, sort of cede our power in this space to um, external actors. Um, so I, I have a, a fair amount of concern that that is a thing that could happen. Um, I don't want it to, I hope it doesn't, but it, it's a, there's a potential there for that. I worry about uh, the patrons and the, what we've already seen over the last decade of use of uh, algorithmically based agents to determine our uh, information input. Uh, I don't think, the last 10 years has been healthy for our society on that front, right? Um, that the uh, filter and bubble problem of algorithmically driven news is uh, real and is bad, I think objectively bad for the world and society. And I worry that us sort of just giving, un uncritically giving uh, patrons new AI tools to be able to filter their own information with will result in more of this sort of algorithmic bias being uh, reinforced. And that's a very hard problem. And uh, it's really difficult to see sort of how we can both use the tool and not pray, not fall prey to the, um, the filter and bubble problem inside of sort of naturally inside of AI and machine learning tools. So that's a thing that worries me, how that falls out and, and, and how we see that emerging. Um, and then I, I also worry about the, the sort of world of um, creativity and creation. Uh, as uh, I think Clara had said early on, a lot of my early research in my career was around copyright and around information um, uh, information, pro uh, intellectual property rights. And um, the new world of AI generated stuff, or even AI sort of manipulated stuff 
is going to be a nightmare when it comes to things like authorship and credit for things and copyright. And there's whole swaths of um, common understanding of, of um, even something as simple as like authors, right? Who authored this? It's complicated enough in the human world to sometimes determine who the author of a thing is. It, once we start mixing machines into this, it is going to be very complicated over the next 20 years to be able to answer that question. And so um, I think this is going to be a challenge for, for libraries and librarians specifically because we care and we upkeep some of the stuff, right? So uh, really quickly, <clears throat> just last two slides. Um, Roy Amara was an American researcher and a scientist. He was the president of the Institute for the Future. And he said, <clears throat> uh, Amara's law, we, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. I think this is true. I think this is also going to be true of AI and machine learning. Uh, we are paying it attention now, but I'm not sure that we're doing, um, I think we may be underestimating it um, for the long term. So, and then last, closing with an XKCD. Um, if you haven't seen this, you probably have at this point, if you're interested in AI and machine learning, but um, the, uh, you know, it's all about the data. We are good at data, but we are often blind to our own biases. And so um, I want to, um, strongly recommend that we don't just keep stirring our pile of data <laughs> until things look good, that we actually sort of dig in and understand uh, how to make the world of machine learning and AI better by making the data um, that ultimately underlies it better. So, and that is all I have to say about that. Uh, this is me. Um, I have uh, email, I have Twitter and a lot of other things. Uh, I have a website. You can always find me. It is super easy to do. I am not a, a, a mysterious figure online. And um, I would love to talk with you about what you might be interested in about this talk or really anything at all. Um, so. Great. Well, thank you so much. Let's give Jason a round of applause. Thank you for taking us on this journey of AI and machine learning and putting into focus our future, especially our future around libraries and information uh, practices and services. So what we would like to do is in this networking session,